Hi there, and welcome to Young at Harp. I am Deborah Henson Koenig. This is Kathleen Wiley. We are going to talk about how to recover your essence when the blueprint gets soggy. <laughs> and we call this Young at Harp because we both play the harp. Kathleen is a Jungian psychoanalyst. I'm a composer and a performer, and we are here to talk about whatever comes <laughs> up. So Kathleen, the reason we're talking about this is I think I wrote to you and I said, I'm, what did I say? I'm, my, my deal right now is I'm working on recovering. You know, what, what if my existential blueprint gets soggy? How do I recover my essence if I can't go back to that blueprint? Like if it's warped in some way. And then we were talking about, well, we want to do it through awareness, process, and then you wrote back and relationship. Yes. So uh, t tell me what I'm even talking about. Well, you know, what comes to my mind, DHC, is that I don't believe our blueprint or our soul's template can ever get soggy or distorted. But I believe that the adaptive self or the ego through which the soul expresses, that can get very... Um, underwater, so to speak, <laughs> meaning, <laughs> meaning that between the inside ball of energy that is the essence of who we are and the outer world manifestation, something happens and it gets distorted in some way. And, and sometimes it just gets drowned, meaning we don't even know what it's at because it's like so underwater, it's gone to the bottom of the ocean of our psyche soul and we don't even know it's there anymore. Oh, ah, I'm muted. Sorry. Okay. Um, so uh, what's interesting to me is so I, I brought up this subject because I was thinking about if there's like if his children were abused or neglected or something, something happens, um, it, we kind of drink the water of that. It's almost like if, we, if there's fluoride in the water that comes into our you know, bones and theoretically is good for our teeth. But if, some, if, if we're experiencing reality in a, a weird way um, and it kind of warps, and I was thinking if it warps our bones or if it warps our blueprint, and then we're trying to recreate reality, we're gonna create, recreate it from this warped blueprint. So if I have it in my mind that, you know, abuse and neglect is, is that's my life. I'm going to keep creating that over and over again. And then, and then I'm not, I'm going to not, I'm not going to know how to create anything different. And, and it also came to me because I was thinking about this toy I used to play with as a kid. It was this um, little bent wood, wood, it was a workbench and it had like holes in it, a circle, a square, a triangle, a star. And then you had toys that were that shape. Mm -hmm. And, but I was always like, but that's it. Like there's six, like, where's the others? Or try to fit something in the wrong place. And I was thinking that happens to us in our lives. We get an idea of existential reality that is only one workbench that only has six shapes. And then we just start fitting everything. Well, that's got to be a star. Oh, I guess that's a square. Okay, so this is going to be a circle. That was part of kind of how I was thinking that, that maybe originally whoever made that workbench, there were all kinds of different shapes they could have, but eventually they just started making those shapes and that's it. I mean, does that make any sense? I mean, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, I'm thinking about Carl Jung's model of the psyche, that the deepest layer of psyche is the collective unconscious for all the shapes for the the workbench are. But that collective unconscious comes up through our personal self. And, and the way I like to describe it is so like we're born with access to the entire ocean of collective unconscious with all the possible shapes. But vis-a-vis -vis our outer world experiences and relationships with other people and objects that have value to us, certain shapes get activated or we learn how to identify certain shapes and to handle and play with them, so to speak. And we just kind of ignore the rest. We don't even sometimes, um, they don't have a draw or an attraction. And so what gets set up then are templates. I, I like to call them learned templates so that it's not the blueprint of the soul that gets warped, but it's the learned template that is the distortion. 
And so that part of healing of any kind of emotional or mental, physical traumas or, or hurts, even if, if we wouldn't label it trauma, um, is getting kind of behind the template that of the history to what else is there. You know, we talked a couple of a weeks ago about the larger self and the. I, I, mean, self. Yeah, I, I feel like we're kind of spinning around this thing. Yeah, right. we're, yeah. in a way, we're in the same territory because um, we do get. It, it, the other way I like to describe it, if you think about the collective unconscious as a circuit board, it's an electrical circuit board. But unless there is an outer world relationship vis a vis another person, usually that lights up that circuitry, like flips the switch for the current to flow through the circuit, it doesn't flow through the circuit. Okay, say, say that again. So just one more. Yeah, way. that if we think about that, the, that our soul is like a, an electrical circuit board, and there are all of these circuits through which the energy can run. But in order for the circuits to become live, the switch has to be flipped in relationship to someone in the outer world. In other words, it takes a relationship to activate the circuitry. And developmental psychology is now showing that this is, is true in child rearing with even some of the most fundamental of skills that there may be, and this is my language, there may be kind of the software and the brain, the brain circuitry for it to come. But unless there's an experience vis-a-vis -vis another person, to activate it, it does not get activated. So this is really interesting because um, one of the things that I'm aware of um, and, and uh, in the work of Karen Montanaro, who's a, a mime dancer and, and um, sort of kind of philosopher, is she talks about this uh, sort of a, um, I don't know how, but an experience that many of us have as artists um, when there, we have an experience when we are alone, when we are almost, it's almost as if we are touched by the thing that is going to be part of our lives. So for example, for me, I, it was, I was home alone and I heard Debussy's La Mer on the, the radio. And it, it was like something reached out of the ether and just touched me and was like, you, you will have a relationship with music your entire life. You will be a composer. This is your language, listen to it. Mm -hmm. And it, it happens, I mean, so I guess that we could say that for me, I was having, I was touched by Claude Debussy and that even though it wasn't in, you know, certainly he wasn't there in the room. Well, I mean, physically. Sure well, so I guess that's, I guess so, so the relationship with, whoa, the relationship with human beings. It's, it's primary. It's primary, but it sounds like it doesn't even have to be physical. Well, you have a relationship with the spirit of Debussy vis-a-vis la mer. Right. So there is a relationship. It isn't a relationship like you and I have a relationship where we're both living and we come together and we have a dialogue. But part of what great what artists do is they in soul a work, they in soul a piece of music or a piece of art, that then when people encounter the work of art or the piece of music, they are moved and touched as if they are in the presence. Of wow, so it's like having a conversation only over epics yeah. and, 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 you know, not, so I'm, 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 as you're talking, I'm thinking, and this is why artists have to share. This is why you have to share your work because you can't have that conversation in the world over time or through time or space if you're not sharing in that way. Right. Because if he hadn't published that, if he hadn't written it, if he hadn't published it, if it hadn't been played, I wouldn't have been touched. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. Huh, okay. Well, wasn't expecting this conversation to go there. Okay. <laughs> but but that's great. Um, and and I, I actually can see us on Facebook for the for like the first time. So hello, I can see you. <laughs> and I can see her comments if you if you make them. Um, so that's great. Uh, so what we were talking about, so I was thinking about this um this blueprint uh, I, of of who we are or what we're expressing. 
And now as you're talking, I'm thinking, wow, in a sense, when Debussy, when, when he writes this piece, it becomes a blueprint for his soul to speak to me. Mm-hmm. And, but, the, but I, I'm also seeing that the blueprint between us and ourselves or our greater self and our lesser self or whatever it is, that I guess the ego, I'd be interested in knowing more about that, that can get warped so that we're only, you know, like it's all, we're only feeding ourselves hamburgers or whatever, you know, like hamburger, that's all there is, you know, <laughs> have another one. Um, so is that, and then, and then, and then that gets resolved or recovered or reignited or whatever through awareness that it's happening process of some sort and relationships right yes and i want to say i think relation for for me in my world relationship comes first because we need each other to see ourselves more fully we need Mm -hmm. each others we need each other to get to know aspects of ourselves we would not otherwise know and so when we are aware, when we cultivate consciousness, when we cultivate paying attention to what goes on inside of us, what's going on around us, when we track the connection between things, when we reflect on how we are affected and how we see we've affected someone else, all of those to me are aspects of of consciousness and how we become more conscious. So in being conscious, we can be aware of just like something in you became conscious when you heard Debussy's La Mer. Mm-hmm. And you were in a family of artists. Your mother was a musician, your stepfather. You were in a family that valued music. And so something resonated for you in a deep, deep way that went further within you than what you were experiencing vis a vis your family. It was something that became much more from deep within your own being that you connected to. Well, right. And that fueled you. Right. And I'm thinking that of all the things that I was, you know, struggling with at the time as a child, you know, some certain obsessive behaviors and st- I was I think it was about eleven. And, you know, being aware of of hierarchy, you know, social hierarchies and stuff like that. But this just whew, went, you know, right through that to the heart of nothing else mattered. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you found the conduit or the conduit for how to live in the world and live the truth of who you are. If you knew it at that moment. Uh, right. I mean, I certainly wasn't living it. I was doing all kinds of weird stuff. But so, you were 11. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, yeah, I was 11, but, but I, I'm just thinking that, that as I look at like, okay, how do we get to the essence of our own blueprint now or the essence of who we are? And I'm thinking, can I go back there? Can I go back there and visit that again? Mm-hmm. Is that there to speak to me again? Well, when you listen now to Debussy's La Mer, what happens? I haven't done it. I don't, that's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking like, uh-huh. maybe that's what I should do. You know, yeah. That, yeah. I mean, yeah. it would be an interesting experiment to see what you felt now. And um, I'm my own, afraid that I wouldn't. Like, what if I don't? That, that doesn't matter. But you know, I'm just thinking, yeah. Well, I mean, that would, I don't know that that would mean anything except that what you experienced at that moment in time in 11 was specific to that moment in time, um, that it can't be recreated, but nonetheless, it's given you a relationship to something in yourself and to music that has transformed your life. Right. I'm thinking like a plant who remembers a specific day of rain may not be able to go back to that specific day of rain, but that day of rain has given it um, its, its life. Right. And you also might find that you would go back into that same state of connection with, um, with we could say with the spirit realm, with, with the numinous energy 
that um, really is the source of all life and the source of music. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. All right. So relationship, a relational, being, being relational with things rather than reactive, rather than just mm -hmm. like, but rather than deciding what it is, actually relate, relating to it. So having an awareness, what is awareness? So yeah, what's, what's relationship, what's awareness and what's process? Mm. Well, that's, those are good questions. If we had Webster's here with that <laughs> and an etymological dictionary. I mean, I think about awareness as consciousness. I mean, if we're aware of something, then we're conscious of it, meaning we know of its existence. And I'm thinking it has something to do with um, differentiation, being able to differentiate. Well, you have to be differentiated to be aware. Right. I'm, I'm, I'm just looking here because... Yeah. I thought that Donald Trump just wrote something in the feed here, but it wasn't. <laughs> put my glasses on. Um, okay. Um, so someone's saying something. Okay, so let's, uh, uh, th this is an opportunity for us to actually have comments. But anyway, you were saying, we were talking, and so I'll, I'll read that in a minute. Um, this is pretty sick. Okay, anyway, so um, uh, you, you were, we were talking about awareness and we were talking about differentiation. And I'm, I'm, I'm just gonna, I remember when I was learning Schoenberg, who was a very atonal conduct, uh, composer, and he had written these pieces called Piero Lunera, a series, and, and in music school, we were gonna have to have a test and you're gonna be able to have to tell the difference between what piece it was. And the first time I listened to it, I was like, I can't tell, they all sound the same. But as I listened to them, they began to have a shape that I understood and a shape that I loved. And then I began to fall in love with them. And then it would, would have been impossible for me not to tell the difference between the pieces. So to me, that seems to be an awareness of distinction or differentiation. But does that like awareness? Uh, what I'm thinking is that there are different levels of awareness. <laughs> and that um, in that case, as you listened more deeply, you were able to hear, to differentiate, differentiate nuances of phrasing and nuances of tones and keys so that there was an awareness that was at a much deeper level than if you just had been aware Oh, that's his piece versus Mozart's piece. Yeah. And I think I also, when you said you were able to hear it at a deeper level, I think I was able to hear it as in not trying to fit it into another, does it sound like regular music, but to be able to hear it as itself. Yes. Yes. To, to really, and hear, and it wasn't just a hearing with the physical ear but it was really a hearing with all of the inner senses that that inner the third eye and the heart and um you were you were hearing beyond just physical hearing right and so there again there's the level of awareness of the physical senses but then there's a whole nother depth of awareness of our inner senses. Okay, which, which is making me think like of the whole point of the external senses is to bring it in so we can then start experiencing that. Right, that's right. I'm gonna read I, what uh, David said. Okay. <laughs> and, um, uh, and, and he says, no, I'm not the Donald, he has more hair. Anyway, but <laughs> it, uh, this wonderful chat, pardon the comment. I remember learning decades ago of something called a spiritual child. That is a third essence that is created when two people develop a relationship. Music is similar or any art form. Your art is part of you, but outside of you too, to be shared with others. This is something that can't be easily described or grasped, but it's something to just accept and plunge into if you can. That's so interesting. Like a third, a third being that gets created 
Well, I mean, it's, it's one of Jung's primary principles, the transcendent function, that when two opposites come together, a uniting third emerges. So the artist shows up with their offering, the audience shows up, and they show up whether there's ever verbal interaction, there are two energy fields. And those two energy fields create something. That's why, you know, a piece of music you play at home by yourself may sound one way, and then you play it um, with someone else or in front of someone else, and you hear something totally different, and something totally different comes out. So that there is always that, that mystery involved with creating. And what awareness does is awareness, the, the more conscious we can be of what pieces are there then the more the more that we invite that third that spiritual child to come well as you're talking i'm also thinking that the spiritual child is like we had a, a we had a big storm and a, a, a butterfly bush fell over and we couldn't pick it up and then this morning we picked it up and the guy who helps me garden he said look when it was on its side it started growing new new things mm -hmm. and and so i'm just thinking that and, and so i was thinking about that and i was also thinking that he also says i was saying why are the tomatoes um still brown on the bottom when there's still water and he said well plants don't go back and fix they they just they go on they they go on to a new thing and as you're talking about this and the spiritual child of this idea i started thinking so maybe that's not the point the point is not to go back and fix the blueprint and it, the point is to go forward, to leave that blueprint and to have relationship that will create this new being in which you can be. Mm -hmm. Well, definitely, I always say to people, our history is our history. There's no amount of analysis or therapy or healing work or spiritual practices that are gonna change your history. <laughs> But what can change is your relationship to your history. And what can shift is the bodily response to one's history. And what can change is one's sense of identification so that one differentiates themselves from their history. So there are things that shift, but the history is the same. To your gardener's point, if the tomato has a brown spot, it's not going to go back and change that. It's going to keep growing. <laughs> right, right, right. It's not going right. to get a bad spot. Right, right. And so I think this is where, again, if we remember that the blueprint of our soul stays whole and stays in the beauty to which it was created, but that the blueprints that we learn to identify with and that we learn to think we are and how we're supposed to be. That's what can get distorted. So the, the, the templates you, that you described. The templates. Right. And that what we, when we begin to get that, realize those two things, then a, a third way of being can emerge that's much more than the learned historical self-template and that can reach to the whole blueprint of psyche soul to express the beauty that is innate within one. So that leads to the third arm that I brought in of process. Of process. So what is that process then? Well, you know, I say this almost every video. It's, <laughs> the process is relationship. The process is being in dialogue with. It, it comes, always comes back down to that, that, that so the process- It's hard to do when you're a recluse. <laughs> well, we can start by even being in dialogue with what goes on inside of us. You know, so it, when my own, um, you know, when my own anxieties about, for instance, playing music with people who played music all their life, when I've only played the harp for, you know, eight years, then when that, when that comes up, you know, I can either run with that negative flawed template because I, as the rest of 
all of us have experiences of feeling less than and being made fun of and shamed. Or I can say, that's true, I don't have that. But you know what? I can do this one thing. Mm -hmm. You're so good at helping your students learn that. You know, the one note or the one chord. And so we begin then to have with awareness and by being in the process of dialogue and living in relationship to all of who we are, we are able then to differentiate from the flawed template. In this case, the negative self-talk about my not being good enough. Yeah, and I'm thinking that maybe we don't even need to differentiate. I mean, I mean, if we're just growing like that plant and we're not even thinking, well, that was that's a brown leaf. Let's get rid of that. If we're just mm -hmm. we're just thinking grow and rain and you know, wow. Um, I don't know. So, but, but what I think I'm hearing you say is this is in, in any case, it's a conversation, whether it's a conversation with ourselves or with someone else or with our spirit or. Yes. Dialogue, you know, the Greek culture was known for the dialectical style of teaching and interacting with one another. And we so badly need that now in our collective and we need that Oh, you you I suddenly I can't hear you. You can't hear me? What, now okay. you're now you're back. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I was gonna say we, we so badly need to to understand and be able to engage in a dialectical process. And, and can you describe that and what a dialectical process is? An exchange of ideas that's respectful, an exchange of shared of, of feeling experiences where we can find a common meeting ground. You know a place where there is an, a dialogue with a equanimity. You know, if I realize the value, for instance, of my historical self that was shamed for being different, less than, and I can be in relationship up to that part of me compassionately, when it kicks in, when I want to play with a group of professional musicians, mm -hmm. then I'm going to be in a lot better position to say, that's okay, that's not my reality here. No one here is going to shame me. You know, the people here are going to nurture me. I can differentiate the present moment from the past. I see. That's a big deal. That's a very big deal. Yeah. Okay. So, so okay, I'm, I'm aware of the time. I, I know yes. it's going to end in like five minutes. Um, so, so I, so just to recap, you know, we talked about relationship, awareness, be, being able to differentiate and the process and the, and the process being, and the process is being in relationship because being in relationship, we become more aware of ourselves and others. If we truly are in relationship and not just seeking ourselves and, you know, seeking the thing that we thought we were. That's right. And so what would be a couple of ideas to, and, and the biggest thing I feel like I got out of this today, which is, is I came into the like, but, but I will never have the pure blueprint again. And, and realizing that that's not the point. It, 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 and just seeing those new growths and realizing those new growths had their own, but they came right out of the tree. Right, that's right. So what would you say to people? What would be a couple of things that you might say to people? And then I might think of something I might say to musicians who are searching for that. Really, it's really a connection to your true self, right? It is a connection to the true self. And we have to find our bit of true self in all of our historical experiences. So for instance, the part of me that got made fun of because I couldn't do something, I have to find that part of me that really wanted to know how to do it. Then now I can, in the present moment, when I want to do something, I can get myself support to learn how to do it. I connect with the bit of true self that's there. And the process of dialogue between two, you know, relationship means two, not one. <laughs> I keep saying, one day I'm going to do a couple's seminar and the title is going to be marriage means two, not one. <laughs> 
you know, we think relationship, oh, we meet us. You know what? Relationships too. And, the, and, and then the couple is the third that gets born. But there are three in a marriage you know, or any relationship. The same is true in ourself. You know, if I can show up with the harpist I am today and I can show up with whatever feelings I have around, you know, not fitting or fitting or doing good enough or not doing good enough or whatever, I show up with all of that and I can stay in communication with all those parts of me, then that's what's going to allow me to stay in the present moment where my process of relating to myself and everybody around me is going to be very different than if I get caught in the historical template. So I think what I want to say to everybody is don't be afraid to be in relationship to the historical you. Don't be afraid to connect with those memories that are painful are those places where you got wounded you can find your essence in those places and you can begin to be compassionate with that part of you that that often that child part that didn't have any resources but as adults now you've got a lot of resources and being in the process of relationship and having an awareness of all those nuances of what goes on inside of one's nature can allow something to change. And in the case of the musician, it allows the expression on the instrument or with the voice or in the movement to be something that resonates because it comes from the heart and then it touches other people. I'm also thinking when you're saying this, a minute ago, you said that there was, you know, if you go back to that pain, there was a moment just before that, that was curiosity or, and, and as you were talking, I was thinking that moment just before the pain, and we often make the template at that moment of pain. Yes. yes. But there was a moment before yes. in which we were experiencing and experiencing vulnerability, the vulnerability of curiosity or desire, mm -hmm. and which is, probably why we got so wounded. And I, I just had never thought about going to that moment before, because that too is part of the history. I tend to get stuck in the part that got in pain. And yeah. what I would say um, in terms of music is, is, is to go back to go back to go forward. I mean, the, to, go, to go to the thing, not not go back, go forward to the things that you loved and that are simple and that's, that are easy to do so that you can speak through them. I mean, like that plant, when it turned over, it didn't, it didn't start growing a different kind of plant. It, it just did what it does. And, and so, um, you know, for me, I'm, I will go back and li listen to WC and I will also go or go forward and listen to WC and, um, <laughs> And I'll also start looking what was happening just before then. What was the quality of my desire? And what was, and just, I just wanna go look at that in, in all the things. What was the quality of my desire and my vulnerability? Yeah, because that's where the soul's blueprint is. Not the, in the template that formed at the moment of pain. It's the moment before, that's the seed that awareness process and relationship can help you reconnect to. Then it can grow something very different. Ah, <laughs> okay, wow. Thank you, Kathleen. You are and welcome. And thank you, David, for, um, for you know, we, we're finally able to connect Yes. And, um, I, and I'll look forward to connecting again um, on Facebook afterwards. And Kathleen, thank you so much. It's just so wonderful to get to have these conversations with you. And um, always so stimulating and inspiring. <laughs> me too. I experienced that. And I'll look forward to seeing you 
next week. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.